This is a 2x4 that I picked up for free on the side of the road. And this is a desktop CNC mill. I'm gonna use this to turn this into something much more beautiful and functional. There's just one problem. I haven't the slightest idea what I'm doing. I've never used one of these before. I mean, it looks kind of like a 3D printer and it functions kind of like a 3D printer. So how hard can it be, right? Carving wood is just level one. Level two is plastic and level three is metal. Let's see if we can get there. CNC is always something I've wanted to learn. I've been 3D printing for a long time and have a grasp on all of the fundamentals as well as the advanced topics. But this is something I'm completely new to. And frankly, it intimidates me. But sometimes 3D printed plastics just won't cut it. Sometimes you want something clearer or stronger or more organic. And those are all things a CNC allows you to make. So when Makehara reached out and offered to send me their Carvera Air CNC to test, I was more than happy to oblige. But this isn't a review, it's an exploration. This is my single solitary point of reference for what a CNC machine is, so I won't be able to tell you what it does better or worse than any others. But I will be able to tell you how easy it is to operate and how steep the learning curve is for those that are new to the hobby. And if you're already a seasoned CNC expert, feel free to point out all my new mistakes in the comments. So let's get into it. The Carvera Era is supplied with everything we need to get started, a series of tools or bits, each of which serves a slightly different purpose, a set of fixturing pieces to hold down our workpiece, and a generous assortment of material samples to accompany the example projects. We must walk before we run, so naturally I chose one of the basic example projects as a starting point. The spoil board goes down first, so we can cut through the workpiece without damaging the machine. We'll then anchor the material with a series of screws and brackets. The material we'll be cutting might look like wood, but it's actually an epoxy tool board, a type of plastic. We control the machine using the companion software, either on a laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Like 3D printers, CNCs operate using G-code, a series of commands instructing the toolhead where to move and how fast. In this case, we have both linear movement speeds and feed rates, which dictates how fast the tool spins. I suppose you could think of that like the extrusion rate on a 3D printer. And just like how 3D printers probe the build plate to determine the height relative to the nozzle, this CNC probes the workpiece to determine the thickness. You can also generate a grid of points in the event that the surface is uneven. Sound familiar? And yeah, I'm going to be making a lot of 3D printer analogies throughout this video, so better get used to it. The instructions for this sample project tell us exactly what bits to use, which is good because I don't know left from right. For this cut, we'll be using this twirly one and a rainbow dagger. Or in other words, a spiral zero single flute bit with an eighth of an inch shank and a 30 degree 0.2 millimeter single flute engraving bit. If that all sounds like Swahili to you, you're not alone. Fortunately, I had an expert on speed dial to explain it to me. My friend Marco operates a CNC for a living. Here's what he had to say. So what's also very important to keep in mind is Let's compare these two cutters. They're both one eighth of an inch flat end cutters. The main difference is the length, right? You always want to make sure that you're not using a longer cutter than you actually need it. Because when you cut harder materials such as acrylic or aluminum, mm. you're gonna have lots of uh, forces and vibrations right. in, um, in the cutter. So if you run the same kind of like G-code with this cutter, you're gonna notice it's gonna make half as much noises as uh, with this, this one. So it's a very, very big difference. Equipped with that knowledge, I was ready for my first cut. The Carvera Era has a convenient tool-free system for changing bits. Simply pull down on the lever to remove the old one and release once you've installed the new one. our first successful cut from the desktop CNC, using three axes to carve a 3D raised relief. But where we're going for this project, we need four axes. The addition of the optional rotary axis opens up a whole new realm of possibilities. We simply bolt it into place, plug it in, and we're ready to go. 
On one side, we have a vise, called the headstock, and the other, a tailstock. Together, these are used to clamp the workpiece for four axis cutting. This test project is split in two passes, a roughing pass and a finishing pass. This presents the perfect learning opportunity because it's exactly the process we'll be using to transform the 2x4. Coming from the world of additive manufacturing, it's pretty neat to me to watch material being removed to form the part. You better get used to vacuuming. We're gonna be doing a lot of it. Just don't let your wife catch you vacuuming voluntarily. You wouldn't want her to get the wrong impression. That turned out pretty cool. It's amazing how much detail we're able to capture. Now let's take what we've learned and transform this scrap into something spectacular. I had hoped to use only the headstock for this cut, so I didn't need to leave a block of material at the end of my workpiece. But because of the asymmetry of the wood, I couldn't get a good grip on it, so I had to add the tailstock. At this point, I had a pretty good handle on the operation of the machine, but I was still yet to prepare any of my own files. And that's where the learning curve lies. To generate G-code for a 3D printer, we use a slicer. To generate G-code for a CNC, we use CAM software. We first need to specify the dimensions of our stock the block of material we start with. Then we can import the 3D model of the part we'd like to fabricate. And now I can reveal what we'll be making, a chest set from a two x four. I decided to start with the queen. I first needed to position it on the stock. Within Maker Cam, I was able to add some cylinders which will help suspend the piece as it's being cut. We then select everything and generate a toolpath. The learning curve is in knowing which tools to use for what job and which settings. I'm familiar with the 3D printing concepts of layer height, extrusion width, and printing speeds, but I know nothing of step over, step down, and feed rate. Fortunately, Makera has a bunch of tutorials to help us learn. And before long, I had a decent grasp on the basics. And as it turns out, step down, the increment of your cutting depth, is akin to layer height. Higher values, more material cut per pass, but also higher cutting forces on the bit, so we can't make this too high, especially for harder materials. Step over is akin to extrusion width. It's how close the cutting passes are to one another. And just like our extrusion width is limited by the nozzle size, the step over is limited by our bit diameter. Other settings like feed rate are material and tool dependent. As the machine started to work, I watched mesmerized as it slowly chipped away at the wood. And before long, our block was a cylinder. And as more material was removed, a chess piece started to emerge. After the completion of the roughing pass, I vacuumed up the debris and initiated the finishing pass. That's when disaster almost struck. The bit descended and crashed into the right side of the workpiece. Fortunately, I was able to hit the kill switch in time to avoid any damage. To avoid that happening again, I regenerated the finishing pass, excluding the cylinder supports, since those don't need to be smoothed anyways. In addition to measuring the height of the surface, the probe also has a laser pointer to visualize the extent of the cut before it starts. This helps tremendously in assessing whether there is any problem areas for collisions with the fixturing pieces. All looks good, so here goes. There you have it. What was once a 2x4 is now a chess piece. A piece of scrap wood from the side of the road is now something beautiful and functional. I like the idea of being able to salvage materials like that, and it's kind of neat to think about where the other half of this 2x4 ended up. Maybe it's part of somebody's deck or some other construction project, but I bet they had no clue when they put this out at the side of the road that some guy would pick it up and turn what was left into a chess piece. But nevertheless, here we are. With wood mastered, we're ready for level two. I'll be turning this sheet of clear acrylic into a part for one of my 3D printers. Let's see if you can guess what it is before I tell you. Back in Maycara Cam, we needed to prepare our G-code. The process looks like this. 
we select each feature of our geometry and assign a cutting operation to it. A pocket cut will remove material from inside, and a contour cut will trace the perimeter. We want to keep the piece in place as we're cutting, so we add tabs to the perimeter so it isn't cut away completely. And I'm adding a chamfer operation to the edges to smooth them out. For each of these operations, we're picking whichever tool is best for the job, and modifying any settings as required. These settings will make a lot more sense after you watch a few dedicated tutorials. The built-in simulation tool allows us to get an idea of what the toolpath looks like, so we can make sure it matches our expectations before we cut. With our G-code ready, I clamped the workpiece, installed the tool, and sent the job. We were making good progress, but it seemed that I made a mistake with the contour operation because it didn't cut deep enough. The nice thing about CNC projects is that we can try again if things don't look right on the first attempt. So I exported just the parts of the toolpath for the contour cut and sent it again. This time it cut all the way through. The machine then paused and prompted me to install the chamfering bit. This is when I ran into trouble. The tabs that were holding the piece in place were too thin allowing it to shift as the chamfer tool acted on it. So I halted the machine and went back to the drawing board. For the second attempt, I made the tabs thicker. This part requires some counterboard holes on the opposite side. So after machining the first side, I flipped it over. For this to work, it's important that the piece is in precisely the same location as it was, just opposite. Well, it must not have been because the holes didn't quite line up. But at any rate, we had successfully machined a crib. Any guesses yet? Let me give you a hint. The transparency is key to its application. And, well, it's not quite transparent enough. The machining process creates micro scratches on the acrylic that give it a foggy appearance. So I flame polished it with a torch. It definitely helped to restore the transparency, but I think I overcooked it because it wore quite extensively. Now for the fit test. If you guessed an extruder cover for the Prusa Mark IV, you'd be right. The clear acrylic allows us to view the gearbox bolts operating and appreciate its beauty, which is sadly otherwise obscure. Because of the warping from the heat treatment, I struggled a bit to get it installed and managed to crack it in the process. But oh well, it still looks cool. All right, that's level two complete. Now for the final challenge, metal. The idea of machining metal was definitely intimidating, especially considering I'd only just used a CNC for the first time a few days prior. At this point, I had gotten a pretty good feel for the CAM software, so I found it relatively straightforward to prepare the G-code. I'm making a bottle opener with pockets for magnets on one side and my logo on the other. The stock is thinner than the finished part, so we must first do a pocket pass to remove excess material and add pocket operations for the magnet holes and opener surface as well. Then we'll add two contour cuts, one for the exterior and one for the interior. To machine the opposite side, we can add a coordinate system and ensure the cuts align. I chose a smaller bit for this operation so I could get more detail out of the logo. Unfortunately, I don't have a bit small enough to do the really fine details, so I'm going to have to simplify it. With the toolpaths prepared, I exported both halves as separate operations. The laser tracing of the perimeter really saved the day here. I knew I was pushing it to fit this design onto the stock. It just barely fit. But in seeing the laser's path, I could tell that the bit would collide with the fixtures. Not good. So I modified the toolpath to cut on the inside of the model's contour, rather than the outside, which bought me some room. It looked like it would just fit. With our bit installed, we were ready to cut. Almost. In order to keep the tool from overheating, we need to prevent metal shavings from accumulating. To accomplish this, we add an air compressor and connect it to the port on the back of the machine, adjusting the flow as necessary. All right, here goes now. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're really doing it. Machining metal. Before long, our bottle opener started to take shape. 
chamfering pass to smooth out the edges, and we were just about ready to machine the other side. We just needed to swap out the existing tool for the finer one. This time the flip operation worked as intended, and the logo started to emerge. A chamfering pass to finish it off, and there it is. All that's left to do is saw off the tabs and sand the sharp edges. The magnets fit in nicely, although I probably could have reduced the tolerance to make it a press fit. I'm used to 3D printing tolerances, which need to be much larger for things to fit. Now it's time for a test drop. Ah, refreshing. And there you have it. One project from each of wood, plastic, and metal. From complete CNC noob to, well, slightly less of a noob. The learning curve honestly wasn't as steep as I thought it would be. The tutorials definitely helped a lot, and the machine itself made things easy as well. Like I said off the top, this definitely isn't a review, but I only have positive things to say about the Makeara Carvera Air. It made it very easy for a beginner like myself to get up and running. The operation of the machine was intuitive, and the software workflow was intuitive as well. There was a few bugs in the software as I worked through it, but besides that, I don't have any major complaints. I think it's a really good option as an entry-level CNC, and as far as I can tell, it's quite versatile, and it should allow you to accomplish most of the things you'd want to accomplish. If you're interested in picking one of these up for yourself, you can check it out at the link below. I, for one, am glad I had an excuse to learn this new skill. It will certainly augment my 3D printing abilities and unlock new techniques and materials. What do you think? Is CNC something you'd like to try or are you already an expert? And what maker hobby should I try next? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, and until next time, happy 3D printing and CNC machines.